Yeah. Hey, don't let the people say anymore. Come, I'm in a sign webinar. What is this? How are you? Not easy. Not easy. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm trying for ABC. Huh? ABC. Australian Don't send anybody. Sending not a Hello sir, good morning. Good morning, Akta sir. Good morning, good morning sir. How are you? How are you sir? Fine sir. Last time you came to Kelly Dental College sir. Yeah, I know, I remember. Last time you came to Kelly Dental College sir. Yes, I remember. Guest lecture. It was a wonderful experience sir. Thank you. Good old days when uh, things were much easy to move around. Those are the days. Now we have to do only online. Correct, sir. <laughs> yeah, good bad, yeah. Thanks, thanks, sir. Cheers, sir. Mm -hmm. so I think we are on time, yes. Good morning. Man. Hello, Dr. Yeah. Uh, good, good morning, Dr. Good morning, good morning Dr. Anand. Thank you, Sharma. Hello, everyone, and a very good morning to one, of, one and all. On behalf of the IPS Karnataka State Branch and all the members, I welcome you today the fourth webinar conducted by the IPS Karnataka Branch in association with NFI Dental College, Department of Prosthodontics. First of all, I would like to welcome our speaker and our president, Mr. Sanat Kumar Shetty, who has been dashing in conducting this webinars and going on with the fourth webinar. I would like to welcome 
Dr. Akshar Hussain, the Dean all of the Yanapa Dental College and past President of the Indian Orthodontic Society. Welcome, sir. You're welcome. It is my privilege to welcome our two senior panelists who are there with us and a very known academicians. One, Dr. Dakshani DM, who has been the Deputy Director of the JSS Academy, JSS Dental College, Mysore, and Dr. Raghunath Patil, a senior professor, past president of the London Society, IPS Karnataka branch, and professor at the VK Institute of Dental Sciences, Nida. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much for having us. And we, during the working day, we had about 400 plus registrations today. And this shows the interest in the webinars that are happening and the participation from all the students from all over the state and all other regional branches. I welcome all of you. And this is the fourth webinar. And we have a series of webinars to go along. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now request our beloved Dean, Professor Dr. Akhtar Hussain, to kindly give his opening remark. Good morning. Dear Dr. Sanat, the president and also a dynamic speaker, Dr. Sunil Dadad, the panelists, Dr. Dakshini, Dr. Raghunath Patel, colleagues, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. The temporary joint is among the most complex joints of our body. Hence, you know, it's very complicated to diagnose and treat. And the causes of disorders are also multifactorial in origin. So any problem that disturbs the complex system of muscles, bones, and joints, which work together in harmony, will definitely result in temporal malleable disorders. And we know that symptoms are also so varied from jaw discomfort, soreness, all, all the way to shoulder and back, you know, all this can happen. And uh, even like earaches, shaking of the joints, limited mouth opening, grinding, clenching, so many things. Numbness, even all, numbness all the way up to fingers are reported. So sometimes it will look like it's some other related health conditions not coming from the PMK. So, so important it is diagnosed. And the treatment also, as we all know, is very varied from giving rest, medicine to pain, pain relievers, stress management, Use of orthopedic appliances, mouth guards, postural training, diet changes, softer food, ice packs, and of course, ultimately surgery. So, so many things. So, it's definitely a very complex joint. And uh, a webinar of this is very important, not only for the students, but also the practitioners. Because we, we get a lot of cases, especially these days, maybe due to stress or whatever, that you know we won't even know exactly how to treat. Because we never had a separate, a comprehensive training to develop these temperament with joint uh, disorders, which we are now started in the college, which uh, of course Dr. Sanat is there to do these things. And we are starting it in a big way where multifactorial people will be joining together. And I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting, informative talk that's going to be today. And I wish uh, all the success to the all the delegates uh, who are taking part in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I would request Abil, uh, I would now like to request Dr. Malika Shetty, Professor in the Department of Prostodontics at Yanapaya Dental College to introduce today's panelist, Professor Dr. Dakshayani MR. A very good morning, everyone. It is my proud privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Dakshayani MR, Professor in the Department of Prostodontics JSS Dental College and Hospital, Mysore. She is also the Deputy Director at the JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research. Dr. Dakshayani completed her BDS and MDS at the Government Dental College, Bangalore. She has several national and international publications to her credit. In her experience of 29 years, she has held several academic and administrative positions in the institution and the university. I welcome you, ma'am, to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I would now request Dr. Kevin Fernandez, reader in the Department of Prostodontics at Yanapaya Dental College, to introduce other panelists, Professor Dr. Raghunath Patel. 
Thank you, Dr. Shreema. A very good morning, one and all. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to our second panelist for the day, Professor Dr. Raghunath Patil. Sir completed his BDS MDS from the KLE Institute of Dental Sciences, Belgaum, which was then under the Karnataka University. He is now currently working as a professor in the Department of Prosthodontics at the KLE Institute of Dental Sciences, Belgaum, and has a vast teaching experience of 25 years plus. He has published 35 plus papers, both national and international. He's also a reviewer of the International Journal of Prosthodontics and Restorative Dentistry. Dr. Raghunath Patil was also the organizing secretary of the fourth national PG convention held at KLE Belga and was organizing chairman of the Indian Prosthodontic Society, fifth Karnataka state branch conference. So has also held the office of president of the IPS Karnataka state branch. He has also been past president, treasurer, and representative to the state at the IDA Belgaum branch. With this brief introduction, I would like to welcome you, sir, to this webinar. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, sir. May I now request Professor Dr. Dakshayani Emmar, one of the panelists for today, to introduce speaker for the day, Professor Dr. Sanat Shetty. Thank you, Dr. Shima. Thank you, Dr. Malika, for introducing me. At the outset, I wish everyone a happy Tasra. It is with pleasure that I introduce Dr. Sanat Shetty. I am sure that many of you know him as is a very familiar person. Uh, but for the benefit of the youngsters, I would like to uh, briefly talk about his achievements. Being an alumni of A.B. Shetty Memorial Institute of Dental Sciences, Mangaluru, he completed both UG and PG from the same institution. His saga of awards has started from there itself when he was given the best outgoing student on completion of UG. Further, he was also awarded the Good Teacher Award in 2019 on the occasion of Teacher's Day. Academically, he has completed his PhD in 2017 from Yanapoya University for his research work on occlusion. Also, he has many national and international publications to credit. To speak of his he has been the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Interdisciplinary Dentistry, he has been the editor for both Journal of Indian Prosthodontic Society and the Journal of Interdisciplinary Dentistry. And he's a part of the editorial board of many national and two international journals. Also, he is an active member of our society and the dental societies. He has been the executive council member for the Indian uh, Prosthodontic Society for the last four years. He has been the past president and the past scientific chairman of the Indian Society of Prosthetics, Restorative and Periodontics. Presently, he's the executive council member of Indian Dental Association Karnataka branch for the past six years. And he's also been the president of the Indian Dental Association of Dakshina Kannada branch. He has conducted many state and national level conferences and conventions. He's also the executive council member of Karnataka Prosthodontic Society and present president. Also, he is very active in his uh, academics at the university, and he has he is presently the uh, member of the board of studies in prosthodontics at the university, and being the um, member. In, in many of the administrative activities, including the Academic Council of the University. With this, I present to you, Dr. Sanat Shetty. Over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I would request all participants to put in their queries or questions in the chat box, which will be addressed by our speaker at the end of the webinar. Also, I would request all the participants to keep their microphone and video off during the presentation. May I now request Dr. Sanat Shetty to share his screen and begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shani, ma'am, for 
that wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Good morning to one and all, all the members who are participating in webinar across the state and maybe some outside the state too. Thank you so much uh, for being around here today. Hopefully this session by me would be fruitful to you all. I'm proudly presenting the picture of the university where I am working, the Inapaya University. For the past 20 years, I have been working here. And after a brief stint at my alma mater, the ABCT Memorial Institute of Dental Sciences, where I was part of the faculty for three and a half years. And from 2020, uh, uh, 2000 onwards, for the past 20 years, I've been working here and I'm privileged to be uh, heading the department right now. Temporomandibular dysfunctions, the topic for uh, today. Uh, orofacial pain has been much of a topic in discussion in the recent past. TMDs being one of the major causes for orofacial pain, which could be very complicating and frustrating for both the dentist and the patient themselves. So we would be trying to decipher what exactly is TMD, what are its etiologies, how do you actually try and manage this complex group of problems. Now, a little bit on the epidemiology of TMD. Most of the surveys really reveal that at least one symptom associated with TMD was seen in 41% of the subjects and an average of 60 to 70% showed at least one clinical sign related to temporomandibular disorders. But only one out of four individuals is aware of these symptoms and reports to a specialist. Now this embraces a broad spectrum of joint and muscle disorders in the orofacial area, characterized by pain, joint sounds and deviatory jaw function. It impairs the quality of the patient's life, in fact, devastates its victims. Further going into the epidemiology related to the age and the sex predilection, it usually affects the young, younger age group, that is around 20 to 40 years of age. And also it is female dominant, more percentage, a large percentage of the people affected are uh, females. And this could be, could be uh, primarily because of uh, a female dominant hormone. Now, patients in the older age group, when they show signs of TMD, they are more related to degenerative changes in the joint rather than related to occlusion, muscles, or joint components. Now, just briefly touching upon the evolution of the word. In the past, many different names were given to the same problem. It was called as Costin syndrome, it was called as the TMJ pain dysfunction syndrome, it was called as the TMJ dysfunction syndrome, the myofacial pain dysfunction syndrome, craniomandibular disorders, and finally we are stuck to one term called the temporomandibular disorders for the past uh, 35 to 40 years. Now what causes temporomandibular dysfunction or disorders, TMD? Uh, many theories regarding the etiology, uh, whereas in the past, it was thought to be one problem associated with TMD, that is occlusion. Now, TMD and occlusion, it's a very controversial topic. 60% of the studies show a direct relationship between occlusal factors and TMD symptoms, whereas the rest don't. Now, generally, it is believed that no simple cause and effect relationship explains the association between occlusion and TMD. But there is definitely a relationship between occlusion and TMD, as I have seen in my clinical experience. But of lately, there are many senior uh, uh, clinicians and doctors who are saying that there may not be any relationship to between occlusion and TMD, or there is no literature evidence to prove that there is an evidence that occlusion could cause TMD. Uh, I would like to say that if you hit the literature with 
a point or a theory to prove, then most of the times it could be fruitful to you. But I have to say regarding occlusion is that we didn't think that it is one of the causes without it being stated in the literature already. And it is very obvious that so many times when the patients who have undergone some kind of crowns or restorative procedures and they have a hyperocclusion related to these iatrogenic factors, they do come back with orofacial pain. So definitely it has got to do with occlusion and uh, nothing else. So once this is corrected, most of the times these symptoms disappear. But this hyperocclusion, I would like to say that would not always cause TMG, TMD type of pain or orofacial pain. And the reason for that, we will discuss a little later in the uh, webinar. Now, presently, what are the factors that we think could be the cause for TMD? Multifactorial, yes, as our dear principal already stated in his opening remarks. Occlusion, I would always like to include this until I come to know conclusively that occlusion does not cause TMD. Of lately, deteriorating sleep quality is considered to be one of the reasons and psychological stress for quite some time people or researchers say can cause TMD. Now, two explanations for the complexity of the temporomandibular dysfunction disorders. One, either the disorder has multiple causes and that no single treatment can cure all the causes. I'll repeat, either the disorder has multiple causes and that no single treatment can cure all the causes or the disorder is not a single problem but represents an umbrella term under which multiple disorders are grouped. Now, TMD, 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 are we complicating it too much? We will go in a very simple way to understand this. So the today's webinar would be dealt under these following headings one after the other. Now, first we will look into what is normal. It is very important for us to know what is normal because without knowing what is normal, we will never know what is abnormal. So physiology and biochemistry of any organ in our body, we need to know them first before we come to know or realize what is pathology and how do you treat it. That is the reason even in all uh, medical specialties, including dentistry, we are taught physiology and biochemistry in first year. Later on, we, talk, we, we are uh, taught pathology and the medicine aspect. So we will briefly see what is normal. Uh, what is a normal TMJ? All of you should be aware of this, but I will still want to just refresh your memory what exactly is TMJ. There is a picture of TMJ, then there are a couple of animations, there's an MRI image, and then of course a dissected TMJ joint. What you can see here is the condyle, the uh, articular disc dividing the joint into the upper joint cavity, the lower joint cavity, and of course the hinging movement and the translatory movement of the uh, temporomandibular joint and the condyle by itself. So these are the things that it, that you can see in these pictures, which are related to a normal temporomandibular joint. Now, apart from the joint, there is also these ligaments, which are very crucial and very important for us. The, the ligaments are the joint capsule, or also called as the capsular ligament, the lateral ligament, the spinomandibular ligament and the stylomandibular ligament. Now, all these ligaments play a huge part in how the temporomandibular joint works and how the mandible moves. And we are very familiar with this, the muscles of mastication. These animations would clearly show that there are two muscles, the temporalis and the masseter. The temporalis being a fan-shaped muscle around the temporal region and the masseter being a quadrilateral shaped muscle uh, from the dragomatic arch to the body and the ramus of the mandible. These are the muscles which we can palpate. So we can tell them they are the external muscles of mastication. And then there are the pterygoids, the medial and the lateral, lateral 
which are more of an internal muscles and which are not directly palpable, uh, which are not directly palpable. These animations would clearly say where these muscles are inserted and where they origin from, originate from. Now, centriculation, a very, very popular terminology as far as prosthodontists are concerned, and it is an important terminology for any restorative dentist. Now, centric relation definitions of late, the newer definitions have two major components in the definition. One is the position of the condyle, that is the anterior superior position. Another one is where it articulates the thinnest avascular portion of the disc. Now we will discuss these two separately. The position of the condyle in the glenoid fossa, the anterior superior position. Now, why this is most suited or why we say that this is the position and this is the centric relation. That is, looking at this dissected cadaver, you can come to know the direction of the fibers of these muscles, the temporalis and the masseter and of course the pterygoids also. We can see that the pull of these muscles is more anterior and superior, driving the condyle in this direction. And of course, this position is a very musculoskeletally, very, very stable uh, position. Now, centric relation in the past, we were calling it as, or the definitions used to say, the most retruded position of the mandible. Uh, make no mistake, it is still the most retruded position of the mandible. The older definitions were talking about where the mandible is going to be positioned in centric relation, whereas the newer definitions are talking about where the condyle is positioned in the uh, glenoid fossa. So it is not that the older definitions are wrong because still to reach this anterior superior position of the condyle, we still need to retrude the mandible and achieve centric relation. So we can't get into centric relation unless you allow the patient to retrude the mandible or guide the patient to retrude the mandible. Now getting into the second part of the definition, it is related to the articular disc. As you can see here on the dissected articular disc, you can see that the thinnest avascular portion or the center of the articular disc is one and a half times thinner than the other areas of the articular disc. Also, what you need to know here is it's not just that it is thinnest, it is avascular at the same time, very, very minimally innervated. Now, because it is avascular, any stimuli, forceful occlusal stimuli or occlusal load would not result in any kind of inflammation. Also, any forceful stimuli would not induce a painful response because of lack of nerves in this area. So we can always say that this is the best suited position to take maximum occlusal load. This picture also confirms that the center of the articular eminence is very thin. As you can see, the light passing through this, uh, at the center of the dissected articular disc. Other aspects which are normal, which we, hey, we as dentists are all aware, a class one jaw relationship, an ideal occlusion, proper overjet, overbite, a canine protected occlusion, a mutually protected occlusion, and of course, lack of occlusal interferences and ex eccentric movements of the mandible. These are all things which we consider to be normal and which we desire that it is there in a normally, a normal stomatognatic system. So once we have come to uh, or aware that what is normal, we will now uh, just move across to see how TMD is cost. Now TMD is cost on when? On this normal group of uh, uh, structures, if there is an insult or an event, we call that call them an insult or an event, then the, it can progress into TMD. So we'll look into these insults or events. These events can further be classified as local events and systemic events. And these local events can again be acute and chronic. Now, what are these local events which are acute? This, it's also called as causes cost due to micro trauma. It represents any change in sensory or proprioceptive input, such as the placement of an improperly occluding crown or an FPD, restoration with high points or any such events which abruptly changes the contact of the tooth. So this can be a trigger like a micro trauma. Or we wouldn't be 
uh, you wouldn't be surprised that even a, a local anesthetic pain in the region of injection or an ulcer caused due to cheek biting, this also can be considered as microtrauma because when there is pain, there's a gen general tendency for us to avoid that area. If you have a painful shoulder, we would avoid trying to move this painful shoulder. Same way, if you have pain in one particular area of the mouth, we would like to avoid that area. So in trying to avoid, it's just that uh, avoiding does not mean that we stop eating or stop masticating or stop doing other functions in the oral cavity. We still do it, but we try and avoid this area and do these functions. When you do this, there is an imbalance that is created in the entire system. And this imbalance also can cause micro trauma at the joint level or muscular level. And of course, all these aspects which are normal in our daily routine can always sometimes cause micro trauma, wide yawning, trying to show your tonsils to your ENT maybe, or an exclamation or trying to eat a jumbo burger. All these things can also cause some kind of micro trauma because you're trying to open your mouth very wide, which is not always normal. Now, what is macro trauma? Just look at this JR. This can cause macro trauma to you. A banana causing so much of injury. But definitely our singham can cause a lot of macro trauma. A boxing duet can cause macro trauma. A cricket ball can cause macro trauma. So what exactly I'm trying to say is any of these injuries in the orofacial region can cause macro trauma. There's another way when you can still get macro trauma, Bluetooth or wireless type of trauma. So this is also possible. Now, what are the chronic local events? We just discussed what are the acute events. What are the chronic local events? Orthodontic treatment. There could be many orthodontists who may not agree with me, but I wouldn't conclusively say that it can uh, cause a chronic uh, uh, event which can lead to TMB, but there are literature evidence stating that there could be a chance. Basically, when you try to correct uh, the proclinations for aesthetic purposes, what exactly you're trying to do is by ret retruding the anterior teeth, you're cramping the tongue. And of course, you're changing the uh, muscular musculature of the uh, lips. And also because of this retroclination of the anteriors, you may be driving your condyles more posterior. These are the things that can happen. And once this happens, you're slightly disrupting the normal, uh, what you can say, balance that is there in the stomatognathic system. So once this imbalance happens, there is always a chance that there could be a reaction in the temporomandibular joint. Now I will tell you that this reaction will not happen in every individual. Why it doesn't happen in every individual? I will come to it in, in the uh, next couple of minutes. Now, another chronic reason could also be a loss of a tooth and patient having not replacing this tooth. This definitely can cause a lot of derangement in the mandibular movement because of the obstruction due to super eruption, mesial inclination, distal inclination of the neighboring tooth to edentulous space can always cause these issues. And of course, unreplaced posterior teeth, especially unilateral, can always load one joint more than the other, and this can cause pain. Untreated painful tooth, and of course, parafunctional habits. These are all the chronic thing, and if you're going to clench your teeth like how Singham is doing, definitely you can end up with uh, a chronic macrotrauma. Now, what are the systemic events? The whole body and the central nervous system is affected due to psychological problems, mostly related to stress. This is for sure everybody knows that stress can cause damage to any of your organs in the body, leave alone temporomandibular joint. So it is a, a, a problem which needs to be sorted out. Influence of emotional stress in TMD is now considered a major and a very important precipitating factor. In such cases, you should be aware that dental therapies are likely to be ineffective and also could frustrate us. Now, if you 
or Salman Khan, and if you are having such a beautiful girlfriend like Katrina Kaif, you are uh, bound to be happy during that phase. And then when your girlfriend leaves you for another man, then you are going to be in stress. Definitely, you are going to be in stress. So it was very uh, famously reported that our uh, uh, muscle man Salman Bai had a, a orofacial pain, which was later diagnosed as temperament uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. So emotional stress can cause anything. And of course, of lately, as I told you, sleep disorders are also considered to be one of the causes and definitely they're going to be chronic causes. And if you do not sleep through the night, then you are trying to sleep through the day. And uh, because you don't get a good sleep, you are going to wake up maybe with a headache. Now, uh, this is the very important point. This next couple of points would, uh, let, uh, would make you understand why everybody when they get one of these insults that we just events or insult that we just discussed would uh, always have a TMD problem. That is because of physiologic tolerance and structural tolerance. Now, what is physiologic tolerance? All individuals do not respond in the same manner to the same event. It is related to the physiologic tolerance of a particular individual. When all the normal, we just discussed is in its place. Initially, we discussed about what is normal or what is the physiology. When everything is normal, then the system can tolerate worst of the insults or events. Nothing will happen as in this case. You will not be bothered if somebody says this. When the physiology of these structures is not optimum, I mean something is abreast in one of these systems then relatively insignificant events can often disrupt the function of the system, as you can see here. So small things can also disturb the system. Now, what is structural tolerance? When functional change, this is also important, when functional change exceeds a critical level because of any of this macro, micro trauma or events, alteration of the tissue begins. This level is known as structural tolerance. Now, each component of the masticatory system has a specific structural tolerance. If structural tolerance of any component is exceeded, I repeat, if structural tolerance of any component is exceeded, breakdown will occur. The initial breakdown to all these micro macro trauma events is seen in the structure with the lowest structural tolerance. Therefore, the breakdown site varies from individual to individual. So it is not that you will have the same problem as the other person for the same insult. So what are the potential sites of breakdown? They could be the muscles, they could be the temporomandibular joints, they could be the associate structures of the teeth and of course the teeth themselves. So these are the potential sites of breakdown. Now this breakdown eventually leads to a combination of signs and symptoms termed as PMD. Now for, for the purpose of diagnosis, TMD can be broadly grouped into two types of disorders, the extracapsular disorders and the intracapsular disorders. Now what are these extracapsular disorders? They exist outside the joint, so nothing to do with the joint. Patients often have little or no mechanical problems in the joint, but suffer the effects of the structures outside the joint. They are the myofascial pain dysfunction type of problems related to the muscle. This is most common TMJ dysfunction and usually involves the muscle imbalance with muscle spasm and pain. This has a multitude of causes such as stress, grinding of teeth, instability of bite and others. Myalgia, that is pain in the muscle, usually presents as a dull aching pain due to muscle injury or strain. It is commonly seen in acute forms, though with the continued muscle tension can present for longer periods of time. Now, what are the intracapsular disorders? Damage or disease to the joint itself, such as the disc, the condyle, the articular eminence and the ligaments. 
Among them, we will discuss a few, that is disk displacement with reduction. Disk displacement with reduction. The animation showing that the disk gets compressed as the condyle moves or translates forward and then it slips back into the original position. It slips back into the original position. That is disk displacement with reaction. This would uh, show you in a cadaver how the disk pops back and when this happens, you will get the click noise. So disk displacement with reduction will, will be able to auscultate for a click. You can see in this animation too, how the disk pops back after getting compressed. Now, what else, what's the etiology behind this? Elongation of the capsular and the discal ligaments, thinning of the articular disc, which commonly results from macro or the micro trauma, orthopedic instability. And now, what are the clinical characteristics? Relatively normal range of movement with the restriction only associated with pain. That means patient might have restricted door movement only with pain. Means he can still open, but it will be a painful opening. Deranged discal movement can be felt by palpation of the joints and a click can be heard on auscultation during opening and closing. Deviations in the opening pathway are very common. We, we will discuss what is deviation and uh, deflection a little later. This displacement without reduction, it's also called the closed lock. Here what happens during the translation of the condyle, the disc is displaced anteriorly and laterally and it gets compressed or squeezed but it does not reduce and come back to the original position and in such a patient you will have a hard end feel i will tell you a little later what is hard end feel and of course there is no click because the disc is not popping back to the original position so the disc click is usually heard when the disc tends to pop back to the original position and that happens only in disc displacement with reduction now again the etiology is pretty similar micro trauma and macro trauma what are the clinical characteristics in this case the mandibular opening is restricted because the disc is anteriorly placed the mandible cannot translate further the disc would prevent the further translation of the condyle. It is characterized by deflection, mandible moves towards the involved joint. I'll tell you what deflection is a little later. Subluxation. During final stage of maximal mouth opening, condyle is seen to suddenly jump forward with the third sensation. Condyle is placed anterior to the articular eminence during this position. Difficult to close the jaw, but the patient is able to reduce the dislocation. This we see very often. Not just in this joint, there are so many people who dislocate their shoulders also and are able to reduce it and bring it back by themselves. That's because of the laxity of the joint and of course flattening of the articular eminence and somehow osteoporotic uh, bone loss with the, the articular eminence may be shaved off or the condylar head may be shaved off and of course the weakness of the uh, capsular ligaments. Now, this location, we all are aware what happens. The condyle goes beyond articular eminence and gets locked there. Whereas, and in this case, the patient is not able to get back. So patient comes to you with an open mouth and we have to reduce it. And this, in, this, in such a case, the pain is or because of the patient trying to reduce by himself and squeezing some of the components of the joint. So this pain, once the dislocation is treated, the slowly it comes down. Apart from these, there are inflammatory and non-inflammatory disorders of the joint itself. They are mainly four in number, the synovitis, the capsulitis, the ret retrodiscitis, arthritis, and arthrosis. The first three are mainly related to micro-microchroma, which can cause inflammation. Arthritis and arthrosis are mainly age-related and they are degenerative joint diseases. Now, after discussing briefly the classification of the TMD, we now briefly talk about what are the TMD symptoms and how do we examine for the signs. Symptoms are those which the patients complain, signs are what we elicit. With a broad concept of normal structure and function already we discussed, symptoms from the foundation for diagnosis and treatment of TMD disorders, for it is by symptoms we recognize what is wrong and which component of the masticatory system is affected. Now, 
these are things which we are aware what are the symptoms that the patients come to you with those affecting the dentition tooth sensitivity tooth pain tooth mobility bleeding gums now any of these could be referred to the head of neck region and patient can say i have tnd like pain then we open the mouth and check and these problems any one of these problems are sorted out the patient may not further come back with any sort of problem of course the masticatory muscle problems mainly the masseter and the temporalis might complain in these areas in showing the sites the pterygoids are being an internal muscle patients may not be able to show what exactly is happening and where it is happening complaints related to the tmj limited mouth opening jaw getting stuck clicking popping grating sounds in the tmj patients also may be able to hear these sounds when they open and close so they may uh, uh, may be concerned about what these sounds are and they may approach you of course some can talk about ear pain and headache also now what are the signs we are supposed to elicit we need to examine the teeth for pain mobility fractured restoration wear facets which can cause sensitivity in the patients overjet and overbite we need to examine whether the ideal optimum and of close the occlusal examination very important part of the examination for us what we are going to examine in occlusion is whether all the normal that we discussed before cr being coincident with the mi with the good intercuspal positions mutual protection canine protection or group function all these things are evidently present in the mouth or anything any dis uh, any despair you are seeing in this occlusal pattern we need to note down and assess whether they could be a cause they need not always be a cause and of course we always uh, don't want uh, uh, occlusal interferences in eccentric movements of the mandible the working side as well as the non working side because we believe Uh, in a mutually protected occlusion being ideal and uh, centric relation is something which we need to guide the patient to to check all these things so until the positions of the tmjs are precisely determined an accurate maxillo mandibular relationship cannot be verified and correct occlusal analysis is not possible bilateral relaxation of the external pterygoid muscle is essential to obtain true centric now how do you go about doing it popular methods are there the chin point method and of course the by manual peter dawson's very popular method can be used to protrude the mandible and seat the condyles in an anterior posterior position in the glenoid fossa to achieve centric relation now there are certain times when we are not able to do it because of the strong uh, uh, engrams that are uh, present in the muscles and they prevent the retrusion of the mandible and in such a case we need to deprogram these muscles and this can be done by various uh, 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 appliances like the lucia jig that we can use which can uh, allows the patient's neuromusculature to seat the condyles in its centric position within the glenoid fossa fossa without the influence of periodontal proprioception or muscle engrams apart from lucia jig you can always use the leaf gauge like this to break the engrams and tongue blade i have seen some clinicians using cotton rolls on the posterior teeth and ask the patient to bite on bilateral cotton rolls for quite some time and once this happens the patient's muscle engrams to the occlusal contacts of the teeth is lost and then it might be easy to retrude also making the patient to do lot of opening closing movement lateral movement tire the muscles once these mandibular mus moving muscles become tired then also it becomes easy for you to retrieve the mandible and seat the condyles in the uh, glenoid fossa in the centric relation position and blade also can be used now getting into the examination of these muscles muscles can be examined by physical palpation and functional manipulation we are all very aware that physically only two muscles of mastication can be palpated that is the masseter and the temporalis now what do we palpate it for we palpate it for tenderness so if these muscles are tender when we palpate when the patient is uh, at rest they show that these could be the trigger points for the orofacial pain 
and if there is pain in any of one of these muscles during clenching that also could tell us that there is a trigger point for pain in the orofacial region that could be a trigger point for pain in the orofacial region now functional manipulation is done for the pterygoids the medial and the lateral pterygoids because we can't feel them from outside the lateral uh, pterygoid and the inferior uh, the uh, medial pterygoids are functionally manipulated by making the patient move the mandible against resistance making the patient open the jaws against resistance uh, making the patient bite on a, uh, a separator so if the trigger point is now as far as examining the tmj after we finished examining with the muscles we need to examine the tmj tmj can be examined by three different ways the palpation auscultation and of course manipulation functional manipulation of the mandibular movements for palpation we can use the extraauricular method by using your forefinger on the joint area palpate for tenderness posterior and lateral to the condyles during the mandibular movements if there is a painful response to force applied to the lateral aspect of the tmjs it may be a sign of capsulitis or synovitis synovitis if there is a painful response to force applied to the posterior aspect of the condyle it may be a sign of os auscultating is for opening click and closing click thud pop crepitation crepitus can indicate degenerative problems such as disc damage example perforations osteoarthritis and in some cases end stage of bone to bone grinding mouth opening can be uh, checked maximum mouth comfortable mouth opening and maximum opening with force now i had told you i will tell you what exactly is end feel end feel is a quality of resistance in assisted opening means patient opens to a certain amount of mouth opening and after that we are assisting the patient or we are pushing the mandible to open now if it is a soft end feel what is a soft end feel where when we try to open the mouth with a little bit of force and patient is able to open more than 5 mm then it is called soft end feel and in if that happens we can take it as a diagnostic factor and call it a muscular issue in a hard end feel that is when we try to force open the jaws with our fingers and if there is less than 5 mm of opening the patient cannot move any further then we can say it could be an intracapsular problem or it could be a joint disorder so it is diagnostic hard end feel soft end feel soft end feel is muscular hard end feel is joint now little bit on the mandibular movements which we are supposed to examine the normal range of mandibular movements we all are aware just to brush up opening closing 40 to 50 mm we can retrude up 1 to 3 mm protrude 6 to 12 mm laterally deviate 8 to 12 mm so these are all the normal range of movements if the patient is not able to do this that means there is some kind of disturbance in the mandibular movements now deviation and deflection i had promised i will deal with it a little longer as you can see in the animation what is deviation deviation is during the opening we stand in front of the patient ask the patient to open the mandible and you can see the mandible going to one side right or left side and then coming back to the center at maximum opening this is called the c or the s pattern of jaw movement now when this happens we call it deviation of the mandible so mostly deviation is uh, uh, muscular and especially when deviation is there without click it is definitely muscular and if it is if deviation is there with click then it's a joint issue so it is also diagnostic now what is deflection now deflection as you can see in the animation on the right the mandible will move towards one side and stay there it does not come back to the center it does not return back to the center so this is mainly a joint issue it cannot be a muscle issue it is mainly a joint issue and most of the times it is a closed lock and generally this deviation or deflection happens towards the involved joint now once we are done with all the examinations around in and around our zone the stomatognathic system then of course we need to get our a uh, fellow colleagues to examine the head the head and neck region because orofacial pain can be due to 
ear, it could be due to throat, it could be due to your something in the nose, it could be some due to issues in the sinuses, it could be due to problem in the eyes. So any of these things can cause orofacial pain. And of course, you can have to refer your patient to a sleep physician to rule out any sleep disorders because that could also be a cause for your TMD. Now, just to brief about what are the other reasons that can mimic TMD, which is, which is definitely not in our purview, is the trigeminal neuralgia, the glossopharyngeal neuralgia, peripheral and centralized trigeminal neuropathic pain, atypical odontalgia, facial migraine, tension type headache, trigeminal autonomic encephalogias. So these are other group of disorders which now are handled by orofacial pain specialists. So there, there could be another specialization coming up, orofacial pain. So TMD being one of them, these are the others. Now, how do you distinguish, little bit we have already mentioned extracapsular, intracapsular. How do you actually distinguish if the problem is extracapsular or intracapsular? Now, method of distinguishing this, one simple method I would advocate is to just give the patient an anterior bite, bite plate and put the teeth out of contact. It aids in the diagnosis in two ways. By eliminating occlusal contacts, it elim eliminates the need for lateral pterygoid bracing and allows the condyles free access to the CR or centriculation by breaking the muzzle and gram. By taking away all posterior contacts of the teeth, it effectively tests the joints for response to pressure. And now, if after giving an anterior bite plate for a few days, problem is not relieved or it worsens, it's an intra-articular problem. If patients become slightly better, comfortable, then it is a problem related to occlusion or muscle, not a joint issue. So this could be diagnostic for us, whether it's an intracapsule or an extracapsular problem. Now, what are the other signs which assist us in diagnosing whether it's an intracapsular or an extracapsular problem? One is mouth opening. Joint disorder, it is restricted and there's a hardened feel, as I've already told, it's stiff. Whereas muscle disorder, it is restricted, but soft and feel and elastic. Patient can further open the mouth if we assist him in opening. Translation of the joint. Joint disorder, it is rough. Muscle disorder, there is no roughness of the joint. Static pain. In joint disorder, there is no static pain, whereas in muscle disorder, yes, there is static pain. Without doing anything, patient still has pain. Protrusion, resistant to protrusion. Joint disorder, nothing. Muscle disorder, you will get pain because of the pterygoids being the trigger points. Joint distraction or biting on a separator, if it is a joint disorder, no pain, and sometimes the existing pain reduces. If it's a muscle disorder, especially the pterygoids, there can be pain on the same side when you bite on a joint separator. Click, where is it seen? It is seen only in the joint disorder. In muscle disorder, you don't see clicks. Deviations and deflections mostly are seen. Deflections definitely are seen only in joint disorders, whereas deviations are also more likely to be seen in joint disorders. In muscle disorders, they are absent. Now, after distinguishing uh, how, what are the uh, extracapsular, intracapsular uh, problems, how do you distinguish between the two by the symptoms and the signs, we will slowly get into the management of TMD. Now, treatments, just as the cause may not be single, I repeat, just as the cause may not be single, there is no definitive single line of treatment. Effectiveness of our treatment also varies from patient to patient. What works for one patient may not work for the other. So the line of treatment should be such that it is reversible. Once again, I repeat, line of treatment should be such that it is reversible. Treatment, what? It ranges from simple self-care practices and conservative, reversible, non-intrusive, non-surgical treatments to occlusal rehabilitation, injections, and surgeries. Treatment should always begin with conservative, reversible, non-surgical therapies first with occlusal rehabilitation and surgery left as the last resort. 
Now, what are the basic treatments? Rest in the jaw, soft food, avoid extreme jaw movements, good posture, apply moist heat or cold packs, advise practicing relaxation techniques to combat stress. This is what we need to advise the patient. We need to tell all these things. Treat all the obvious insults or events that might have caused TMD. If there was a hyperocluded crown, if there was a hyperocluded restoration, if there is an ulceration, which the patient is having pain on one side and anesthesia related pain, any of these events that we discussed at the beginning of the lecture, if you examine and you see it, definitely we need to treat if there is an untreated missing tooth. Uh, due, and uh, supra erupted molar, we need to treat them. All the obvious causes of TMD, which we are aware, need to be treated. And of course, these drugs can help the NSAIDs, the muscle relaxants, the anti-anxiety medications. If, if you are suspecting any issues of anxiety and depression, and of course, antidepressants, all these things, uh, the uh, last two cannot, cannot be prescribed by us uh, unless we take a consultation from the respective specialists. Now to the popular occlusal appliance therapy. I, I told popular, but nowadays some people are trying to make it impopular. They say that it has got no role to play. I would, and there is no literature evidence to say that it has a role to play. Now, simple thing is, if there is, if there is no literature evidence, how am I aware of this? Where have I come to know about this? How did it come in so many textbooks and articles that, and how, how, how so much of uh, uh, discussion and description of how these splints are, are to be made has come about. So there is literature evidence, as I already stressed upon that if you go trying to hit the literature saying that uh, this can may not be a useful tool to treat TMD, you will still find a lot of literature which would say that yes, this is not a very uh, important tool to treat TMD. Whereas if you go with an intention to know whether this is an effective uh, tool, then you will still get literature which would say that yes, it is an effective tool. So it all depends on which direction you want to hit the literature. There is sufficient literature evidence to suggest that use usefulness in treatment of myalgia and myalgic and arthralgic pain with occlusal therapy. Now functions, what are the functions of the splints? A well-fabricated splints have at least five functions. That well-fabricated word is important because you do not fabricate it rightly, then of course it can uh, cannot be, it may not be useful and sometimes can be hazardous. To relax the muscles, to allow the condyle to see it in CR, to provide diagnostic information, to protect teeth and associated structures from bruxism, to lessen periodontal ligament proprioception, thus eliminating muscle and gram. Now, what are the materials with which you can make these splints? We are all aware there are just two materials that we can use, the hard acrylic resin appliances and the soft appliances. Now, the advantages of the hard acrylic resin appliances is that we can do occlusal adjustments in the mouth because our acrylic can be trimmed. But the disadvantage of these hard acrylic resin occlusal appliances is that they are not very comfortable to the patient. And because to retain these appliances, you would want these appliances to slightly get into the undercuts of the teeth. Because if, if they don't get into the undercuts of the teeth, then it is not going to stay. If you do a maxillary occlusal splint, and if, if you are not getting into undercuts of the teeth, it is just going to drop down. So we need these splints to slightly get into the undercut. So being hard, it is not very easy to make it go into the undercut. So these are the issues with hard acrylic resin, whereas they have the advantage of it being, we being able to adjust it in the mouth. Now, these soft types of uh, splints are very, very compatible for the patient, easy to wear. It goes, snaps into the undercut and stays there. All these advantages are there and patient friendly too, but you cannot adjust these resilient or soft occlusal splint materials in the mouth. You can't trim them. So they both have their advantages and disadvantages. And also uh, sometimes these uh, soft splints can have a reverse effect because the patients will nicely start chewing on it just like a, 
uh, they're chewing on a uh, chewing on a gum and that can increase the muscle activity we have seen some patients perforating these splints and coming in less than a week a big hole is made on these soft splints now how exactly do we manage if you're not going to use any of these now nowadays we do get this dual laminated type of splints wherein the fitting surface is soft whereas the uh, opposing surface the occluding surface of the splint is hard uh, so this helps this easy seating and comfort to the patient and at the same time the hard occluding surfaces allows us to uh, adjust the occlusion so that we get even occlusal contacts all around and uh, some of the uh, examples of these are, are the hybrid night guard the pro teeth guard central guard all these now if you want to fabricate it yourself uh, there is a way to do it uh, that is uh, by uh, there is a way to do it that is by uh, first adapting a soft uh, uh, your uh, what is that um, what we use for bleaching this soft trace the soft uh, thermoplastic trace you can adapt first and on top of that you can uh, slightly roughen the occlusal part of this uh, 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 splint and then uh, sprinkle on method you can use and adapt acrylic on top of this uh, so that you have a, a harder acrylic surface on the occluding side and a softer surface on the fitting side so it uh, we can ourselves fabricate uh, this dual laminated kind of uh, splints too now what are the types of splints how do you classify these splints all splints are classified as either permissive or non permissive now what are permissive splints allows the teeth to move on the splint unimpeded which in turn allows the condylar head and the disc to function anatomically examples of permissive splint include the bite planes anterior jigs the lucia jigs the anterior d programs as well as the full coverage so you can you can see in the uh, first picture here in this first picture here the different types of uh, uh, a permissive splints and of course this is the nice flat plane lucia jig which can completely put the posteriors out of occlusion and then deprogram the muscles and maybe give a good comfort to the patient these are permissive splints allows the mandible to move what are non permissive splints they are also called as directive splints or stabilization splints it has a ramp for an indentations that position the mandible in a predetermined position and secure it there examples of non permissive splints are the muscle relaxation appliance mra or the anterior repositioning appliance the ara so these are some of the pictures of these and the aras so these stabilize the mandible in one position the mra is also called as the gnatologic splint or the michigan splint now what does this mra do provides joint stabilization protect the teeth Press, redistribute the occlusal forces, relax the elevator muscles, and decrease bruxism. So these are what uh, some of the advantages of using an MRA. Now, briefly describing the MRA, I will not go deep uh, deeper into how these splints are fabricated because in our webinar one there was a beautiful presentation, excellently as described how do we fabricate and equilibrate a splint. Dr. Mahidhar, who did our first webinar, has done it. so i don't want to get back into that detail because most of the audience that i can see are similar to those who have appeared in the first webinar the uh, muscle relaxant appliance is generally fabricated for the maxillary arch even though you can fabricate to the it on the mandibular arch but we would prefer it to be on the maxillary arch because we want the mandibular uh, teeth to uh, occlude with the maxillary teeth rather than the reverse and provides an occlusal relationship considered optimal for the patient when it is in place the condyles are in the most musculoskeletally stable position at the time that the teeth are contacting evenly and simultaneously any splint it is important a full coverage splint it is important that we equilibrate these splints in the mouth i'll repeat we need to equilibrate these splints in the mouth and make sure there is there is even contact of all the teeth even contact of all the teeth if if there is uneven contact one side teeth touching more other tile side or anteriorly touching more posteriorly touching less if there any imbalance is there you are not helping the patient you are in fact making the patient worse 
If you want canine disclusion, you can get that by a, just a small spike in the canine region on the same splint. The treatment grown with MR appliances is to eliminate the malocclusion that has contributed to the patient's TM disorder. That means you're trying to provide an occlusion or a contact of the upper and lower teeth, which we feel is optimal and which, which has a nice flush contact, good distribution of occlusal load. So we need to trim and adjust this appliance in the mouth using our uh, famous or well-used articulating papers and get even contacts everywhere. Now, which type of splint to be used and when? When do you do this? Briefly, I would like to say that when there is bruxism and headaches, but you don't see any TMD signs in or intracapsular problems, the use at night of a full coverage splint in which acrylic covers an entire arch is often adequate to protect the teeth because you want to protect the teeth from bruxism. It's important that even contact of all teeth with the splint surface is achieved as I already told. Muscle relaxation is an added benefit that often relieves or eliminates tension headaches. So studies suggest that a minimum of three to four millimeters increase in vert vertical dimension is necessary to protect bruxing patients. So these are from various studies. What should be the ideal thickness of the splints? The, uh, most of the studies say that three to four millimeters is an ideal thickness for the splint because the splints could be thin or thick. How do you decide on the thickness? Now, if the patient is wearing a splint three to four millimeters in thickness and still experiences muscular soreness, headache and or facial muscle tightness, immediately after waking up, splint thickness should be increased incrementally until the symptoms disappear. That means we go on slightly adding on the same splint, your acrylic material and increase the thickness until the patients feel comfortable. Now, if the patient has headache, muscle disorders, and shows TMD signs, now what is the splint of choice? Identified by joints that click, pop, or grate, these disorders tend to be more chronic in nature unless there has been an acute exacerbation and are associated with more damage. Stabilization splints are the treatment of choice, the MRAs, are they, as they provide long-time wear that is usually needed for such a uh, patient because he's got TMD signs. They also cover the entire dental arch, ensuring that the covered teeth do not move. If you're using anterior bite plates or bite plates like this or the Lucia jig, we should, uh, we can make out that over a period of time and even a few days later, there could be some kind of occlusal derangement happening because you're putting the other teeth out of occlusion. So you need to cover all the teeth fully so that the teeth, these teeth don't move by themselves. They must be worn continuously for 24 hours. They are not just night guards, except when eating, for as long as required to eliminate muscle, disc, ligament, and tooth symptoms. Three to six months of wear is often required. These disorders may be reversible if detected relatively early and treated appropriately. So we can always reverse these conditions if detected early. The problem is most of the times patients do not turn up to any specialist as we saw in the epidemiological studies at the beginning of the webinar. Now, when there is headache, muscle disorders and advanced TMD signs and symptoms. Now, identified in patients who experience jaw locking or noises, painful joints, sometimes increasing pain with splint wear, Patients with acute trauma may require an anterior repositioning appliance for seven to 10 days to keep the condyle away from the retrodiscal tissues so that the inflammation can subside. When you use an ARA, anterior positioning uh, appliance, what we are trying to do is we are bringing the mandible uh, forward and putting the uh, condyles away from the retrodiscal tissue, tissues, which, which can be the cause for pain and inflammation. These patients often have a long history of joint pain, locking and instability. Stabilization splints are treatment of choice. Once ARA is done, the patient's pain is uh, 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 sorted out. Then we can give the MRA, the stabilization splints, and must be balanced to accommodate the soft need, uh, specific needs of the patient. Splints may need to be worn for six months to two years sometimes, depending on the patient's compli compliability. These disorders are usually not reversible, but with treatment, patients can experience passivation of symptoms. Symptoms may be reduced. 
Now, when these basic splint type of treatment, all these fail, then we can use other things like the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, the ultrasound treatment, the trigger point injections, and the radio wave therapy also can reduce this muscular and joint type of pains. When simple reversible treatments fail, then what we have to do is we need to shift to irreversible and aggressive procedures after a thorough assessment of the underlying problem. The irreversible treatments, once again I mentioned, the last option, eliminating all occlusal interferences in lateral excursions, both working and non-working side. You can do that by a simple enaminoplasty. We will not go detailed into how to do it. Orthodontics, if you want to change the position or restore occlusal stability because you feel the occlusion is not ideal, correcting occlusal plane in case there is missing tooth and supraeruption, crowns for badly malposed teeth, and in case of severely worn down dentition, a full mouth occlusal rehabilitation. Surgery should only be considered after all other treatment options have been tried and patient is still experiencing severe persistent pain. These our oral surgery friends can help us with. The different types of surgeries, just to make others aware, is ortho, arthrocentesis, arthroscopy, and open joint surgery. So with that, brief uh, management of TMD, I would like to conclude that temporomandibular dysfunction is a complex pool of disorders which need to be treated with a lot of caution. A thorough knowledge of the symptoms involved is needed to diagnose the problems. Complete assessment of signs and symptoms is the key to accurate diagnosis. As sleep disorders, stress, and psychological problems compound on the existing issues, careful management of the patients with conservative treatments is the need of the art rather than aggressive irre irreversible methods. TMD, 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 have you all got it? Thank you for listening. I can take some questions and I'd like the panelists to uh, come in first and then I would like to take the questions. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your immense knowledge and expertise. Uh, now I would request our panelists to moderate the next session. Thank you, Dr. Shima. It was a very good presentation and the, uh, the thorough uh, explanation of the TM uh, disorders by Dr. Sanat has been very simple and underst understood by many, I suppose, because there are very few questions and it has been, and the comments has been that it is a very informative session. Truly, it was an informative session where Dr. Sanat started the session talking about the revolution of the name itself and now it being used as temporomandibular disorders. Then he went on to talk about the normal TMJ, the ligaments and the muscles involved. He also touched about the centric relation the, and how these things, along with occlusion and eccentric movements, can lead to temporomandibular disorders. He was very clear in talking about the microtrauma and the macrotrauma and what all constitute these micro and macrotomas. I'm sure that all those who are listening would have a clear picture of what, when do we consider it as microtrauma and when it would be a macrotoma with very good illustrations. He, uh, he further went on to talk very elaborately on the diagnostic component, especially with regard to how to diagnose the intracapsular, extracapsular, and how to examine the TMJ and still think about the signs and symptoms as a diagnostic feature rather than any other investigative uh, in investigations that have to be carried out. Now, and then he... Uh, went on to talk about the treatment aspect, starting from the simplest of educating the patient and trying to change the lifestyle of the patient so that the 
pain that he, the patient is experiencing due to, due to the temporomandibular disorders could be eased out. And he also went on to talk about the much more complex treatments, including the recent most where a dual splint can be used. And finally, he has concluded about the more permanent treatment aspects, especially with regard, starting from even there, he has started from enameloplasty and then gone ahead and seen where it, were, it would be absolutely essential to do a full mouth rehabilitation instead of jumping to full mouth rehabilitation at the beginning itself. That was a very conclusive one. And further, when we are not able to um, resolve the uh, uh, pain uh, uh, symptoms of the patient, then go for surgical if required was a very good one. And not to forget about the other causes for the temporomandibular disorders that we have to be aware of, especially when it is other neurological disturbances or even psychological uh, disturbances that the patient might be suffering about. That was a very good presentation. Over to uh, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Raghunath. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. Sanat, it was a very nice presentation. And uh, as you said, the diagnosis is very important to treat the damage of pain. Because unless and until we diagnose is it a muscle disorder or a joint disorder or internal disorder or what. So unless and until we diagnose properly, we will not be able to satisfy the patient. And uh, whatever the different tools we use the diagnosis, they are uh, really to be studied so that we can arrive at a diagnosis and we can treat the patients. And uh, especially the uh, other factors also should be kept in mind regarding the external causes like psychological factor, stress. So all those three factors need to be considered to diagnose the TMJ disorder. And then you have briefed it very nicely and we have put it very nicely. I congratulate you for this your presentation and thank you very much. Dr. Thank, you. thank you so much. There is one question here which says, will there be any change in the occlusal pattern if we give stabilization splint for a long term? Dr. Sun. Yeah, absolutely no. There's uh, uh, stabilization splints are uh, always uh, full coverage splints. So whatever the occlusion, patient's occlusion has been there when we plan a uh, stabilization type of a splint, it will remain the same because it is covering all the teeth and not allowing any teeth to move. If you are using partial coverage type of splints like the jigs and all that, only then there could be a change in the uh, uh, occlusal pattern and this change can sometimes be hazardous to us. So when we are using these partial coverages, we should be doing it only on patients who are very aware of what they are getting into and who will not just run away with your splint and not come back for two weeks or three weeks in such a case and they continue wearing it in such a case there would be an issue uh, of, of supra eruption and we are disrupting the entire in, uh, masticatory balance in his mouth so uh, only those patients who whom you think would be coming back for regular reviews you can use these partial coverages and then uh, we can uh, what we can say, examine them on a uh, regular basis and see for any changes. And these partial coverages are all only always meant for very short time, maybe in days, definitely not in months and years. Yes, doctor. Uh, I think all others are uh, appreciating the uh, information that has been given. So that should be a very nice uh, presentation. And there is another question here which, which asks, what will be the recall schedule after the treatment to assess our treatment? Meaning to say that what should be the recall schedule? Now we cannot actually specify what would be the recall uh, schedule because as I told you, there are uh, uh, innumerable, innumerable types of uh, treatments that we already discussed depending on the cause for TMD. So each one, if, you're, uh, if the patient is... Uh, feeling fine, better in a couple of days, we will get back, patient has to get back and we can review. In case we are talking about giving splints, then definitely patient has to be in continuous review. Maybe uh, the initial review could be uh, as early as 24 to 48 hours 
to maybe weekly and later on if the patient is feeling better and comfortable where you don't have to change the uh, much in the splints then maybe it could be a monthly recall uh, that is as far as splints are concerned but whereas the regular uh, 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 treatment conservative kind of treatment where we are not doing much other than get uh, taking care of the dental needs of the patient and uh, making sure that they are not the cause for the orofacial pain then uh, recalls need not be a, 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 a scheduled type of recall yes what okay i think these are the few questions that were there from the participants i think as uh, uh, you said there is going to be multiple visits for the uh, patients to be visiting the dentist when required a lot of uh, interpersonal relationship and convincing the patient and counseling the patient might become very important because usually these tmd patients usually are motivating them to continue treatment would become very important i suppose very true very true ma'am yeah so with that i think i congratulate dr sanand for this beautiful presentation thank you, thank you so much yeah over to dr sanand and dr shri uh thank you so much sir thank you so much ma'am i would now like to request professor dr anand patil professor and head at kle dental college also a ec member of ips karnataka branch to deliver the vote of thanks thank you very much uh, good afternoon friends myself dr anand kumar j patil professor and head department of prosthodontics kle vkds belagavi so on behalf of indian prosthodontics society karnataka state branch uh, i would like to give vote of thanks to our today's webinar speaker dr sanas shetty professor and head enapoya dental college and is also our kps president it was a wonderful presentation sir and Thank you. Uh, we re really enjoyed your presentation and uh, if it would have been a physical presence it would have been much more better even would have watched your body language because uh, i experienced that when i attended that uh, Uh, master class so it's a really you. wonderful presentation and you made a, the tmj a very complex subject into a much more simpler subject and i also would like to extend my thanks to our today's moderators uh, dr dakshini madam deputy director jss academy and uh, our uh, beloved dr raghunath patel sir uh, former hod and uh, professor department of prosthodontics kelv kds bragavi as well as uh, dr mallika shetty madam and uh, dr kevin fernandez for introducing our today's moderators and also uh, our uh, faculty members and students for attending this webinar and making it um, much more successful thank you very much one and all and uh, now i end it over to dr sunil dade and uh, dr sunil dade the organizing secretary without whom the these webinar series would have not been possible so thank you very much dr sunil dade now i hand it over to dr sunil dade for continue I thank the KPS for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, KPS. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I also like to take this opportunity to be grateful to the IT department of Yanapaya University, with a special mention of Mr. Rajesh Karkera and Mr. Deepak Raj. I would also like to thank my dear co-PG, Dr. Surya Teja. for giving tremendous support during the conduct of this webinar with this few words i dr shreema katil bid adieu to one and all have a wonderful day thank you thank you one and all thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. ಸರಿ ಕೊಡಿ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಸಂಜೋಯ್ ಬಂದ್ ಕೊಡ್ಬೇಕು